All right, so today we're really diving into the deep end with this one. We're tackling Order of Battle. Ah, Clausewitz. Clausewitz. Chapter 5 of On War. And It's a good one. Oh, I'm sure it is. But I got to be honest, at first glance, not the snappiest title. Order of Battle. Sounds like something you'd find in, like, a military textbook from 1800 and something. Not exactly a page turner, you know. Well, appearances can be deceiving. That they can. That they can. So convince me what's so fascinating about Clausewitz on order of battle, especially for our listener out there, someone who's probably got a lot more firsthand experience with actual battles and orders than we ever will. You're right to point that out, because even though Clausewitz was writing back in the 19th century, what he has to say about how armies are structured, it's eerily relevant, even now, even in the modern age. Okay, so he's got some serious foresight then. Like, he was predicting the future of warfare. In a way, yeah. He had this uncanny ability to cut through the fog of war, so to speak, and see those underlying principles that hold true across time. And order of battle, well, it's like the DNA of an army, he argues. The DNA, huh? Okay, so break that down for me. When he says order of battle, what's he actually talking about? Because my initial thought is like, isn't that just the battle plan? That's what I thought at first, too. It sounds deceptively simple. But Clausewitz, he goes way deeper than that. He's not just talking about where you line up your troops for a specific fight. He's talking about the entire system of organization. So it's bigger than just tactics. Way bigger. It's strategic. It's fundamental. He defines order of battle as how an army is divided, organized, even how many infantry, cavalry, artillery units there are, and crucially, how all those different pieces are arranged, not just for one battle, but for an entire campaign. So like the underlying structure of military power. Exactly. And he uses this really interesting phrase. He talks about this blend of arithmetical and geometrical aspects to it. Arithmetical and geometrical. Sounds a little bit like we're back in high school math class, not talking about war. Right. Clausewitz was a military man through and through, so it makes sense he'd use those terms. But when he says arithmetical, he's talking about the numbers, yeah. the raw quantity of troops and units you have at your disposal. Okay, that makes sense. Got to know how many soldiers you're working with, right? Exactly. But it's the geometrical aspect where things get really interesting because this is all about how those units are arranged in relation to each other, how they're deployed, their positioning. It's about their relationship to one another, not just their individual existence. So it's kind of like chess, right? You've got your pieces, each with their own strengths and weaknesses, but it's how you move them across the board that determines victory or defeat. Perfect analogy. I think Klaus Evitz would have liked that one. Because it's about creating a system that's both powerful and flexible. And that flexibility is key because the battlefield is anything but static. And he was writing at a time when warfare was changing rapidly. I mean, those rigid formations that were so common in the 17th and 18th centuries, they were becoming obsolete. They were literally getting stuck in the mud, bogged down by their own inflexibility. Clausewitz saw that firsthand. He was ahead of the curve in seeing that, yeah. right? Because it seems so obvious now, but back then, to challenge those traditional military doctrines, that was revolutionary. Oh, absolutely. And he didn't shy away from pointing out the flaws in those old ways of thinking. He had that analogy of the earthworm. Oh, yeah. Cut an earthworm in half. And... You don't get two earthworms? Nope. You just have a big mess. Yeah. And that's what was happening to those armies that lacked that flexible order of battle. They were getting cut to pieces. Exactly. It's like trying to maneuver a tank through a narrow alleyway. You know, you need that agility, that ability to adapt to the terrain, to the enemy, to the unexpected. And what's really fascinating is that Clausewitz, he saw this shift happening in his own time. He even points to a specific example of the evolution of cavalry tactics. Oh, interesting. So we're talking about the shift away from those massive cavalry charges we always picture, yes. like something out of a movie. Exactly. Those big, dramatic charges, they were becoming less and less effective. And Clausewitz, he was picking up on that. In the late 18th century, you start to see cavalry being used in a more decentralized way, less about brute force and more about like strategic flexibility. So instead of just being this battering ram, they become a more nuanced tool on the battlefield. Exactly. They were operating behind enemy lines, disrupting yep. supply lines, scouting, conducting raids. Basically, they became more independent, and that actually forced the entire army to adapt. That makes sense. It's like the cavalry became this kind of independent strike force, which then had this ripple effect on the entire army's organization. 
Right. And that shift in thinking about cavalry actually paved the way for the modern core structure that we see in armies even today. Instead of these massive, unwieldy formations, you have smaller, more self-sufficient units that can operate independently, but then also combine forces when needed. It's about adaptability, just like you were saying. It's fascinating how these things evolve, right? You see a change in one part of the military, and suddenly it's impacting everything else. Mm -hmm. So how does all of this tie back to order of battle specifically? Is Clausewitz saying there's some magic formula, like an ideal number of divisions an army should have? Well, he does dive into that question, and I bet our listener has strong opinions on this from their own experience. I'm sure they do. So what's the verdict? What's the magic number? Well, there's no magic number, unfortunately. But Clausewitz, he actually argues against overly simplified command structures. He says that if you have too few divisions, your army becomes this big lumbering thing. It lacks that agility we were just talking about, that ability to adapt quickly to changing circumstances. So you're saying having too much centralization can be just as bad as not having enough. Exactly. He says if you go too far in the other direction, if you have too many divisions, you run into different but equally dangerous problems. Okay, like what? Too many cooks in the kitchen? Uh, something like that. Communication becomes a nightmare. You lose that vital coordination and control, and suddenly your army is just a collection of disparate parts instead of a unified force. Klaasowitz was adamant that finding the balance between those two extremes that was one of the fundamental challenges of building an effective military force. It's about finding that sweet spot, right? Not too centralized, not too spread out. You need to strike that balance between control and flexibility. For our listener, that's got to be a constant tension, right? Absolutely. And it's here that another one of Klausowitz's key insights comes into play. The importance of what he calls the combined arms approach. Okay, remind us what that means again, combined arms. Essentially, it means having a mix of infantry, cavalry, and artillery at various levels of the army. And this is important, especially for those units that are operating independently. So it's not enough to have just a big mass of infantry, a separate group of cavalry off doing their own thing, and then some artillery scattered about. They need to work together. Precisely. And I'm sure our listener has seen this firsthand. To be truly effective, each unit, especially those operating independently, needs to be like a microcosm of the whole army. Interesting. They need to have the ability to fight on their own, to adapt to different situations. And that means having a mix of capabilities at their disposal. That makes perfect sense. It's like that old saying, the holes is greater than the sum of its parts. Each part needs to be able to function independently, okay. but also contribute to the greater whole. And this principle of combined arms, it seems even more relevant today than it was in class at its time. Absolutely. Think about the complexity of modern warfare. We're not just dealing with infantry, cavalry, and artillery anymore. We have air power, cyber warfare, drone strikes. It's a whole different ball game. But that fundamental principle, having a mix of capabilities at your disposal, being able to respond to a variety of threats that remains as relevant as ever. It's like Clausewitz was laying the groundwork for understanding the complexities of modern warfare without even knowing it, you know. It's amazing, isn't it? Now, I have to admit, when we first started talking about order of battle, I thought it sounded kind of, well, tactical, like something you'd worry about right before a battle, you know. But Clausewitz seems to be saying that it has implications that go way beyond the battlefield. You're absolutely right. He emphasizes that the way an army is organized, its order of battle, it has this ripple effect on everything from strategy and logistics to even political considerations. Wow. So you're telling me the way you structure your forces isn't just a military decision. It's a political one, too. Without a doubt. Think about it. If your army is organized in a way that allows for rapid deployment to different regions, that gives your political leaders more options. It might even deter potential adversaries. He says they know you can respond quickly. Exactly. So yeah, order of battle, it's not just about moving pieces on a board. It's about creating a system that's adaptable, resilient, and ultimately serves the broader goals of the nation. And for a listener who's living these realities every day, understanding those connections, that's essential. So for our listener out there, someone who's dealing with the very real challenges of commanding troops in the 21st century, what are the key takeaways here? What can they take from Clausewitz, a guy writing in the 19th century, and actually apply to modern warfare? You know, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? And honestly, I think Klausowitz would be the first to say there's no magic formula. Context is everything, right? So what you're saying is there's no one size fits all order of battle that guarantees victory. Not a chance. The way you structure your forces for, say, 
a jungle operation is going to look totally different from how you'd organize for urban warfare or a desert campaign. And that's why Klausowitz keeps coming back to this idea of adaptability. He's really challenging us to think of order of battle not as this fixed thing, but as a dynamic system, always evolving. It's like they say, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Right. You've got to be able to adjust on the fly. Exactly. And to do that effectively, you need a system that allows for flexibility without sacrificing control and coordination. That's the tightrope we're always walking, that balance between too much rigidity and too little structure. Like that earthworm analogy again, right? Too rigid and you get cut to pieces. Exactly. But too much freedom and you're just a bunch of scattered units unable to act as a unified force. So finding that sweet spot, that balance, it's got to be an ongoing challenge, especially for our listener who's dealing with a level of complexity in warfare that Klausowitz couldn't have even imagined. Right. I mean, he wasn't thinking about cyber warfare or drone strikes when he was writing. But here's the thing. His principles, they still hold up. This idea of combined arms, for example, it's more relevant than ever. We've just expanded the definition of what those arms are to include all these new technologies and domains. And don't forget that point about order of battle having these strategic and even political implications. If anything, that's even truer today than it was back then. Absolutely. The way you structure your forces has a huge impact on your ability to respond to global events, to deter aggression, to even just project power on the world stage. It's all connected. It's amazing to think about how Klausowitz, writing almost 200 years ago, was grappling with these issues that are still so relevant today. It's like he was laying the intellectual groundwork for modern military thinking. That's the beauty of studying these classic military thinkers, isn't it? They challenge us to look beyond the immediate situation, the specific technologies of the day, and focus on those timeless principles that really determine success or failure. And for our listener who's facing those challenges head on, in the real world, hopefully this deep dive into Clausewitz has been, well, if nothing else, a good reminder that they're not alone in wrestling with these questions. And maybe, just maybe, it sparked some new ideas, some new ways of thinking about the art of war as it exists today, because ultimately the decisions our listener makes about how they structure and deploy their forces, their own order of battle, those decisions have real consequences. And understanding the principles that Clausewitz laid out, well, that could make all the difference. 